Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, my friend? Going great. We are going through a scorcher here. It's Definitely ignited with the heat here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I know it as we talked about it before uh, and earlier, but how's it going over there for you? It's good, good. I'm I'm just down the street from you, pretty much. But you know, the humidity is definitely a factor. I had a workout this morning that I was drenched by the time it was an outdoor workout, and I was drenched by the time we were done. So it's definitely humid outside, but we're looking. I think there's going to be a nice uh, clearing of the weather this weekend. It should be really nice, so we can enjoy the time outside with our families. But uh, speaking of, you know, really nice days, I think our day was enhanced really from our guest today, who was Paul Copcut. Paul is someone that I actually made connection through LinkedIn with. uh, And that's interestingly enough, because that's some of the things we dived in this episode and talked about. So he is a personal branding strategist. He has his own company and he's worked with primarily real estate professionals and investors for the last four or so years. And so he's really, really niched into that that market. He said during the podcast that roughly 95% of his clients operate within the real estate industry. So he was able to really provide some very unique insights for t- people in the real estate industry. And so we kind of dove into the concept of, you know, what's personal branding? That's, that's uh, something that usually people misconstrue with just what you post on social media, when in reality, it's more of a holistic approach. And how do you approach that on a day-to-day basis to make sure that when people are talking about you when you're not in the room, that it's a positive experience versus a negative one. And then some of the other things we talked about, some of the missteps that people make when they're starting to develop their personal brand, uh, some of the hiccups they encounter, or some of the things they completely forget to do during that process. And so that was very insightful as well. And then we kind of touched on how to create content and then consistently post content over a period of time to make sure that your personal brand grows significantly. And this is not a get rich quick scheme. This is not something that you're going to be able to become the next TikTok sensation or whatever else. But if you approach your day-to-day operations and and your day-to-day content strategy from from this perspective, he was able to show with a case study that we talked about at the end that you can really make significant strides towards your goals and, you know, maybe even break your goals even before you even thought it was possible. So that's kind of the quick insights that we gained from this uh, this podcast episode. Jeff, do you have anything else you'd like to add? From what I've taken away from the podcast, uh, Paul's a great guy. He uh, he loves what he does and is passionate about it. And I know he's got a lot of uh, great tidbits and things to do. Uh, if you are looking to to build your personal brand, I, I know I am. And I took away a lot of a lot of great things. So. Yeah, I know. And, and I, like I said, I really think that this is going to be a very valuable episode for you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into the podcast. Well, hey, Paul, great to see you as always. Hey, yeah, thank you. Oh, of course. Yeah. And for those of you guys who know, Paul's actually tuning in from Canada, just north of us. So uh, we're really excited that he's been able to hop on the call with us and share his many insights. And I know you guys will gain a lot of value from our discussion. So what we try to do, especially right when we start the interview, is to learn a little bit more about the person on the other side of the table. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and really what got you interested in the personal branding and marketing space. Yeah. So you may guess from the accent, I'm originally from the UK. I transplanted here back in 1996. So I actually arrived on Canada Day in 1996. So that's always my my extra day of celebration, which is kind of fun. Um, I live in uh, Hamilton, which is about 30 miles west of Toronto, which is Canada's version of Steel Town. So it's the, the equivalent of Pittsburgh. So I got into sales and marketing pretty early on in my career. I actually started in banking and hated it. Um, felt like a human cash dispenser. So I got into sales and marketing, classic kind of consumer goods sales, back and forth into various industries, ended up in medical devices, and then with a biotech company, and I transferred with the biotech company here, helped them launch in Canada and North America, 
And then I ended up going back into recruitment, which I used to do in the UK. And I was recruiting sales and marketing people. And I was getting a little bit tired of working for other people. So I finally kind of jumped on the entrepreneur bandwagon and started my own recruitment business. And I came across this whole concept of personal brand around about early, early 2000s. I read Tom Peters' book, Brand You 50, and I thought, yeah, that totally resonates with me. And so I started to use some of his ideas with candidates, kind of helping candidates stand out in the job market. And one of the candidates turned around one day and said, could I pay you to, to coach me on this? And I, well, I guess you can, so why not? So that's how it kind of all started. So I started to speak on the subject across North America. I've worked with everybody from Fortune 500 companies, professional athletes, and then I've, I kind of, to be honest, perfectly honest, stumbled into the real estate space about three and a half, four years ago. Um, my original real estate investor client found me on LinkedIn. And she said, I like your profile. Uh, could you help me write one? And also, I need to help build my real estate investing business. Can you help me with that? And that's, that's how I got into it. And then I got introduced to another investor and then a real estate club and so now pretty much everything I do, I still work with a number of professional athletes, and but the majority, probably 90, 95% of my clients are in the real estate space. It's an interesting, you know, background because you have the, you know, interacting with people on a regular basis and really trying to get a feel for who they are as a person from the recruiting standpoint. And then obviously the sales perspective, how do people interpret who you are on a broader scale? So obviously I'm sure that helped immensely as you were starting your business and, you know, helping others grow their brand uh, on, a, on a national level. So. That's awesome. You, you spoke about you discovered personal branding. Can you elaborate what is personal branding and then why would it be so important for someone in the commercial real estate industry? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, I mean, the concept of personal brand is very similar to branding a product. You know, the, if you think about the products that you know and love, the reasons that you choose those products over others are not necessarily because of the features and benefits of those products. It's the emotional connection that you've attached to that product. You know, you look at people that love Apple. Well, people who love Apple will not use, you know, Windows PCs, you know, and people who have an Apple computer, if you see somebody sitting using their Apple computer in an in a airport, somebody else who's an Apple user will walk past and kind of nod and kind of, you know, there's that kind of tribe feeling with a, with a product. So when you look at a an individual and a personal brand, it's a very similar thing. What you're trying to do is identify what are the unique attributes and skills that you have as an individual that you can present that differentiate you from everybody else who's doing what you're, who says they do the same thing as you. So if you're looking at in commercial real estate, well, you know, everybody in commercial real estate can say, I can sell you a, an office tower, or I can sell you a manufacturing plant or whatever it is. You know, what's the difference? You know, why should I go to one commercial real estate person over another? And the reasons will be that emotional connection. So it's very key that people get clear about, I mean, there, there are two sets of attributes that are, that are critical to understand about your personal brand. One is a set of rational attributes. So rational are what I call the table stakes. They get you in the game, they get you considered. So it's a classic things that you'll see a lot of people in real estate say or it actually generally across a, a lot of professions but people will say you know trusted honest sincere well yeah those are all great attributes and, and you want that in somebody that you're going to do business with but they're not differentiating because everybody will say they have that but if you suddenly say you know i'm the fun commercial real estate broker or i'm the quirky real estate broker or whatever it happens to be that's an emotional attribute that you don't need to be a good real estate person, but it differentiates you. And then once you're clear on that is how do you get that forward so that people start to see it? And that will, you know, the one thing that people need to remember is you don't need to be something for everybody. You know, there'll be a set of people that will want to do business with you, but there'll also be a set of people that don't want to do business with you. And that's fine because it's not a good fit for your brand. So it's, you know, people are a bit fearful of putting their personal brand forward because they think it's going to turn people off. Well, that's okay because the chances are those people aren't your, aren't your people anyway. I 100% agree with you on that front. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the fear of, of you know, being too you know, niched, 
You know, you, you feel like, oh, I'm going to be losing out on these different opportunities that could present themselves if I try to niche down too hard. But in reality, like you said, it's they're probably not meant to work with you anyways. So if you even got them as, as, a, as a client, in reality, the experience probably wouldn't be good for either party. So really getting over that that fear of, you know, narrowing yourself too much can be of qu quite a benefit uh, to, to people. And I always talk to people about personal branding because a lot of times – people don't really focus on it. And, and in my opinion, it's probably the most important thing you can do as a business owner is to create a personal brand because that's going to precede you walking into a room. People are going to know you right away, especially if you have a strong enough personal brand before they even know you, they'll know if they like, know, like, and trust you. And I mean, in, in business, that is, is immense. Uh, so a hundred percent agree with you on that personal branding, the, the personal branding side. I think it's uh, important to emphasize as well, Raphael, everybody already has a personal brand, whether you do something with it or not. So it's much better for you to be in control and knowledgeable and managing it than kind of putting something out there and you don't know why people are rejecting you or you're not generating business. And it could be that you're doing something with your personal brand that's turning people off and you're just not aware of it. So that's the key is, is knowing that whether you do it or not, you have a personal brand. Absolutely. Me being a business owner, I learned that. <laughs> years ago uh and uh how that does separate the people that it's actually it, it separates people that are um that you want to work with and you don't want to work with right and i think that it's a huge benefit i think it, it there's more harmony there more happiness in in what you do and what you love if if you find your people essentially by using your personal brand so yeah, and, and, Thanks, and John Lee John Lee Dumas uh, talks talks a lot about it. And we had a guest on the, the show that talked about it. Your vibe will find your tribe. So whatever vibe you're putting out into the world, your tribe is naturally going to be gravitated towards it. So that's something that you know just to keep in mind. So, so if if you were going to work with someone, what are some of the common missteps you see real estate professionals do when they when they try to develop their personal brand? Well, one of the big things I, I see is that people assume that social media is personal brand. So, you know, just posting a bunch of stuff on Facebook or something is, you know, that's your personal brand. Or, you know, a classic one is people think a logo or a tagline is your personal brand. Well, no, it's, you know, uh, it's uh, Jeff Bezos that said, uh, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And I think that's the one thing that people need to, really get clear about is is or understand is people are forming an opinion of you as you as you said Raphael people are forming an opinion before they've even met you because it, there's no way that somebody's going to meet with you for business if they haven't already googled you checked you out maybe reached out to a few people they know to see if you've done business with them or you've interacted with them uh, you, you can go on LinkedIn and see who they're connected to and, and find out more about people prior to actually meeting them than ever. And that, that's the, you know, one of the dangers and missteps that people do is they don't think about that. They don't think. It amazes me how many people have never Googled themselves. And I, I just say, have, have you ever Googled yourself? And like, no. Well, let's see what it says. Like, really? Yeah. And then and you just go straight online and show them. They go, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. And, you know, sometimes there's things there that they say, well, hang on, that's not me. Well, somebody thinks it's you. Um, and you know, more challenging if you've got the more common name as well, which you know, I'm, I'm fortunate there's not many cop cuts around in, in North America, so it's pretty easy. But there, but there is a Paul cop cut that's a choir singer in the UK. So, I mean, some people might think that's me, but hopefully not, because I certainly can't sing. But you know, so you, you, certainly that's a misstep. And, and people feel that you know, in terms of their brand, you know, once it's done, that's it. They don't need to do anything else. Well, no, everything you do, every interaction, every time you send an email, make a phone call, shake somebody's hand, that's a reflection of your brand, good or bad. And you know, that's, I think that's a misstep that people continually forget. You're always on show. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a more holistic type of view. And, and, and I love what you sh shared about you know Jeff Bezos, because in reality... You, you never know, right? You could be interacting with someone and have a great rapport, and then behind your back, there may be something else being being said through just your either what you're projecting out in social media or maybe some deals you've done with other people throughout your your career that have fallen flat. You know, so in reality, like you said, it's more holistic. Your personal brand is, and so what you project out into the world, whether that's social media interactions, emails, whatever, is really dictating who you are and how you're being perceived by the people that you ultimately want to do business with. So, 
Absolutely. I, I, mean, I know you said uh, most people don't uh, Google themselves and, and it's a, actually uncanny of how many people do not do that. Um, and then speaking of that, what are some of the best platforms to focus on if, if you're in the commercial real estate industry for your personal brand? Is there something that some of the commercial real estate people that I've worked with, I've tended to get them to focus on LinkedIn first and foremost, because it's a business to business network. And what I, what I like about LinkedIn as well, it's pretty much underutilized by a lot of people in real estate and particularly commercial real estate. And it's, un, it, it's used in the wrong way. You know, people assume, again, I, I can post something on LinkedIn and I'm just going to get, you know, the phone's going to be ringing for the next week. Well, no, that doesn't. It's, it's very much about building, you know, it's the same. Networking online is the same as networking in person. It's building relationships. It goes back to that no like, trust. Um, but you can do it, you know, on scale and, and not have to leave your office to, to build a good network as long as you're, going in with the mindset of adding value and, and looking to help people because that's what, you know, at least to me, that's what networking is about. It's yeah. Eventually, hopefully there is going to be business at the end, but I don't go in with the mindset. What's in it for me. I go, how can I help this person? Who can I introduce them to, you know, ask them, what, what are their struggles? Um, so LinkedIn first and foremost, and, and if you know, a lot of people think they need to be everywhere and, and I'm much more of a fan of, you know, get, get really good on one platform and okay when you've got that nailed okay think about the second platform but you know first and foremost you know where where are the watering holes where are your target audience hanging out where are you most likely to meet professional people who are you know running large uh, offices or you know large corporations or the kind of people that you're trying to interact with chances are they've got a profile on linkedin and it it's such a a great network social network platform it's still really one of the few where i think you can do a lot there for nothing and you haven't got to pay to play and you know it's the downside with with facebook uh, and instagram is it's almost a pay to play model now if you want to get noticed or or even get your posts seen you've almost got to pay for it whereas with linkedin you can utilize the second degree connections um you know something that i found when i came from the uk it, in the UK, the Brits don't really leverage schools and colleges and universities. It's, it's much less of a, a networking thing. Whereas here in North America, it's, it's huge. I mean, people will do business because you went to the same school, even if you weren't there at the same time. And the university uh, networks on LinkedIn, you can use those unlimited in terms of reaching out to people. You're not, you don't have to have a paid account to continue to network with people. And if you went to the same university, you can just go straight through on, on LinkedIn, go to that university and then look up the years, the job titles, the companies, the locations, and that's all free searching. So you could, you could home it right down very quickly to, you know, here's the 200 people you need to be aiming at. And then, okay, who do I know that knows them? Or do you want, do you reach out and say, Hey, I see we went to the same school. And I've, I've seen so many people just connect because they went to the same school and that starts a conversation. You know, you mentioned the sports team or something and boom, you're, you're in and you're having a conversation and that, that barrier is broken. The glass is, is shattered a little bit and that's an element of trust has just gone up a notch. And then, okay, look to add value. How can you help them? What else can you be, be doing to, to introduce them to somebody, an opportunity, whatever it happens to be? And, but don't go in the mindset of sell, sell, sell because... That, that comes down the road, they'll eventually ask. They'll eventually say, how can I help you? Then you've got the door open in, in an authentic way versus a pushy way. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So I actually used that exact strategy when I was getting out of college. What Essentially what I did is I was looking for job opportunities outside of you know what, what I was doing. And so I started reaching out to people that were associated with the same school, my fraternity. I was in a fraternity in college. I started reaching out to people in the same fraternity that I was in. I started reaching out to different organizations. Like I was in the Society of Professional Hispanic Engineers. I started reaching out to people who were so affiliated with that. And I got conversations with probably about 30 or 40 people just through saying, hey, you know, I, I saw on your LinkedIn page that you went to this university or I went, you were in this fraternity or, or you were affiliated with this association. Uh, I'm to give them a little background on myself. And I wanted to, you know, I, I want to learn a little bit more about what you do because I'm trying to figure out what my path is. And then I would get a call and I'd, I'd sit down with them or talk to them for an hour. And sometimes I would turn into multiple calls 
I had several people forward resumes over to different organizations. And that same logic can be applied in a business setting where you just try to learn a little bit more about their business, et cetera. And that affiliation, that, that connection point is, is huge, like you said, especially here in the United States, because I lived in Europe as well. And, you know, the university is kind of more of a commuter type of type of environment. You're not really like strongly connected to any one university. You go to the university, you get your degree and you kind of go along your merry way. Whereas here in the United States, it's a little bit different. And like you said, the watering holes, right, where people congregate, you know, there's a lot of commercial real estate groups out there. And you could just, you know, touch base with people in different markets and try to pick their brain about what they do. And then that maybe could potentially become like a referral partner for opportunities. So there's, there's different ways to approach the, the LinkedIn platform that can really benefit you and your business. So that's awesome. So I wanted to, you know, sh talk to you a little bit about content creation, because that's one of the biggest hurdles I feel like a lot of people face is that they're like, I have no idea what to post about. You know, I have no idea what to even start, how to start this particular journey. So I guess what advice would you share with people who are trying to figure out what type of content to create? Well, if we look at LinkedIn as an example, good news with LinkedIn is that everybody, everybody is not there every day. Uh, I think it's the average Facebook user, the last I heard a stat on it, the average Facebook user is on Facebook 17 times a day. So if you're putting out content, you've got a potentially a one in 17 chance of that piece of content being seen by the person who's in your network at that time or, or a connection of that network. But with LinkedIn, I think it's something like 17 minutes a week. It's a big, big difference. So you don't have to be doing a lot of content creation to put, put something out on LinkedIn. The other downside is that the majority of people, when you put content out, and LinkedIn is not alone in this, uh, they're kind of catching up on the other social networks is a small fraction of your network actually see your content. So I, whilst content is important, I think that you need to kind of balance that with how much time do you have? What's going to give you the biggest return for your investment in your time? And yeah, content creation, maybe you post a, a long form article on LinkedIn once a month that positions you as an expert in your field and maybe give your listeners are kind of structure to follow, but that's probably as much as you need to do, maybe a post or two a week on LinkedIn. But you know, most of the most of the action is in the messaging. It's in the one-to-one -one reach out, make connection, make connections for other people, add value. Yes, comment on other people's uh, posts. Don't just be the cheerleader. Don't just say, oh yeah, great job. You know, see if you can actually add value to a particular post. Um, because again, that raises your profile because people will see you as kind of contributing something a little bit more than a, a rah rah. But I, I would say the messaging first and foremost is is where you're going to get the most return for your time invested. But you know, with LinkedIn, you can be spending five, ten minutes a day, fifteen at the most, and, and you'd get a lot back from it. You know, once you start to look at the other other networks and, and content from that perspective, you know, it's it's a game. I mean, it's you know, I don't spend a ton of time trying to create a lot of content on any of the other networks purely because I know just a fraction of, of my connections are actually going to see it or, or it gets passed on and the chances are going viral or something like that nowadays are very, very minimal. But I heard a great analogy. Michael Hyatt is a leadership coach and, and business owner in, in the US and he likens uh, the social networks as your embassies. So your, web, your website is your home country and everywhere else are embassies that Give people a flavor for your country, but what you want them to do is obviously come visit your country. So, you know, the goal with social networks is really to try and eventually get people back to your website and then hopefully into some kind of email list so that you can start to message them and you then have much more control of the message, what you send to people, how you send it to people. And then, then your content is going to have value because you could be sending out, you know, a regular newsletter with, you know, some good quality content. You're adding to people's knowledge. You're providing insights into the marketplace, for example. In terms of content, I'd be focused more about you know, a good weekly blog post on your website that's keyword optimized, and then some kind of email list that is sending out regular value to people. That, that's where I'd focus uh, content-wise. But in terms of a, a structure, I've mentioned a structure. Think about the things that make you stop and click, the things that make you stop and read. You've got to have a hook. It has to be something that kind of stops the person from scrolling. 
Um, you then need to tell a story because we all love stories. And if you can relate something that's happened personally, and it may not even be business related, I find a lot of success people have is, is taking a personal story or a personal reflection and then turning it into a business uh, relation in some way or another. And it can be very simple. Um, I did one uh, for a client just the other day, and it was about building its National Sandcastle Building Week next week. <laughs> Or, or this week, I can't remember when. Um, and so we, we made a story about her building sandcastles on the beach as a child. And what she wanted to do was build one and then get the rest of the kids helping her build others. And so we made a joke that that was her first joint venture partner. And then it could, we transferred the, the whole article over to joint venture and then you know, all the other things that she wanted to get across. So if you take a story and then turn it into the lessons you've learned from that story, always have a strong call to action. You know, there's no point in putting content out there if you're not asking people to do something with it. Could be, you know, just like it, share it, comment. You know, do you agree? Do you disagree? Or is it more something more set up a phone call or, or whatever, but a call to action? And then summarize the whole thing again. And just grab it with a paragraph at the end and say, okay, if you do this, this, and this, this is what you're going to get. Nice. On um, some of those things, it, it kind of touches with me. I know uh, me personally with content, just developing it in general. Um, and like kind of how often to post and, uh, and, and you kind of explain that on LinkedIn there. But my question to you would be like, how can, for instance, myself or any other person with content, how can we stay consistent with that? Uh, can you elaborate on any tips that you may have of <laughs> how to, how to okay, stay so, consistent? And So you've, pro you've probably heard the, the phrase, the cobbler's children have no shoes. Well, the personal brand expert isn't always the best person with his own <laughs> personal brand. So I'll, yeah. I'll be perfectly, I'll be perfectly honest and open that, you know, trying to stay consistent is probably, I mean, you guys know what it's like, you know, you're running your own yeah. businesses. You've got a million and one other things pulling on you every day. Um, yeah. I'm a big proponent of, uh, and I've just finished reading it again for the second or third time, uh, eat that frog by Brian Tracy. It put that one hour aside right at the start of the day. Don't open the phone. Don't open the, well, the computer you might have to because you're going to create content, but you know, turn off all the notifications, one hour, write content or post content or spend that 15 minutes on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're hanging out. It's probably you know, selling for your business, doing sales for your business is probably the most important thing you can be doing on a consistent basis. You know, once you've got the business, there's a million and one ways for that business to be handled. You could be outsourcing, you could be bringing in other people to help you, but you know, you you are the face of the business, and so you know, placing that priority on it and putting that time aside first and foremost, because you know full well if you set aside three o'clock till four o'clock in the afternoon to do content, by the time you get to three o'clock, it ain't happening because something yeah. else has come up, some other emergency. I always say there's no such thing as a personal branding emergency, but I managed to fill my day with them most of the time. So, <laughs> I mean, that's great advice. I mean, I'm going to, I can definitely start to utilize that in my uh, schedule and routine to, and, and reap the benefits of that. So it's great, yeah. great yeah, advice. And things that I've done a little bit of is, is coming up with, you know, especially from a business standpoint, you know, topics and ideas can sometimes be hard to come up with, but a lot of times what I what I realize is that, you know, my clients and people that I work with seem to ask the same amount of questions, like same different questions. And so what I've done is to just create like a frequently asked questions series where, you know, I answer a question about X, Y, Z, and I just release a video a week. And it could be like, you know, why are, what the pros and cons of SBA loans are. It could be what, you know, how do you find a good retail property? You know, how do you interpret a, a lease agreement? You know, so like just basic stuff like that, whereas I don't have to think as much about trying to produce, you know, in a significant amount of content. And then when you do stuff like this, for example, like a podcast, you could tape snips of this podcast. You know, there's we, this is probably going to be a 30 minute to an hour podcast. And there's a bunch of great information that's been shared in here. So why not repurpose that content? Take some of the major points of what we've been talking about, chop it up into 30 second or a minute or two minute intervals. And then just create that as a piece of content, especially from the video standpoint, you have the video and audio. So, I mean, as far as like recommendations for people who are trying to create content, repurposing content and just trying to think of, of ways to answer questions that are generally asked within your business could be a, a great way to, you know, generate ideas for those types of content. 
that's a great point, Rafa. And not just the questions you're you're continually asked, but also what are the ten questions you wish somebody asked you but they never do? And you know that's ten pieces of content. So if you did the yeah. ten questions everybody asks, and then the ten that they never ask, that's twenty weeks of content straight away. And and you can you can take the video and audio, take the audio and get it transcribed, and that's a blog post. I do that all the time. Rev.com, by the way, if you guys don't know, you just take the video, you hire someone on Rev.com, it's like a dollar a minute, and you throw it out there, they'll transcribe it all for you. And it's like, if you pay the dollar a minute, I think it's like 95 or 97% accurate. And that's could be your blog post. You just take that up, you edit it, format it right, add a picture at the top, blog post. So if you guys are looking for ways to generate like blog content, use a video, repurpose it, and, and put it on your website. So that's awesome. All right. So one of the things that I thought it'd be, would be great to learn about is, could you walk us through a scenario where you've helped someone in the real estate space in particular uh, effectively grow their personal brand? If you could provide some sort of color to that, that would be awesome. Yeah, probably um, Probably the best example is my, my original real estate investing client. So she, she was working full time, actually, in a corporate job. And she had a real estate business that she'd started you know, on the side, a portfolio she was building. I think at the time when I met her, she maybe had six doors, maybe six houses. So this is residential. So she said, okay. And interestingly, she had a podcast, which is pretty unusual. Um, this is three and a half, four years ago, but she had nothing else. She didn't have a website, uh, no social media, didn't even have a business card. Um, so literally we, we sat down and said, okay, What's the plan? You know, what's, first of all, you've got, to, you've got to think about what's the longer term goal. So she said, well, I'm, I'm going to retire in 10 to 15 years. And, and she was 30, 31 at the time. And I, was, I went, yeah, right. You know, I'm not, I, I, yeah, great, great if you can do it, but I, I can't see it. So, she, so the, the goal is to replace my corporate income. So, okay. And she was in a, high, a well, well-paid sales role senior sales role. So, so we sat down and we looked at, you know, what were the things that she wanted to do in terms of get noticed for? And she was very focused on the, uh, the Burr method. So we said, well, okay, let's, let's focus on, you know, you're becoming a leader in Burr in Canada and, and known for that. And, and how do we do that? So we started to look at, you know, the podcast. She was very inconsistent with the podcast. So it, it was, you know, appearing one week, then didn't appear for two weeks and then appeared again a different day and say, okay, we need to get onto a, a weekly schedule. It's, it's going to be every Friday at 9 a.m. You know, it's going to be, people are going to expect it. Started a newsletter for her, same thing, sending out the podcast episode, bit of news, what was going on in her life. We've got logo designed and a, and a business card and a website built. Uh, then she managed to get a couple of speaking engagements at, at some real estate conferences, which kind of raised her profile uh, that little bit more, got featured in a couple of magazines. She'd already been featured in a couple of uh, big newspapers, which was also helpful. And then we started to look at doing some coaching programs. People were starting to ask, how can you help me? I'd like to do what you're doing. And each time she was still building her portfolio. So, of course, we had great content from that perspective, you know, another house, another door. And she was holding on to all those. Um, so we event eventually ended up with two self-directed online programs, a group program. She runs a VIP coaching program. We got sponsorship on her uh, podcast. So advertising sponsorship. And, and the, you know, the interesting thing with that is if you looked at her download numbers, you'd get pennies on the, on the pay-per-click model of podcast advertising. But because she has a very niche targeted audience, she was able to go to people that absolutely wanted to talk to that same audience and was able to get decent uh, sponsorship so uh, come three years october last year she she quit her nine to five so she's now effectively retired um she's still doing coaching and burr and everything else uh, but now she's focused much more on uh, land development new new build developments and she's just bought a a resort in the lake area in, in ontario and they're going to be building tiny cabins and theming them and hopefully doing a TV show. And so she's, she's really come on and, and, you know, she would put a lot of that down to, to sitting down and having that branding conversation three and a half years before and, and being consistent, you know, it, it all worked about clarity, uh, consistency, and then just constantly 
working at getting that brand out there and making sure that people picked up on that. So that's, you know, she's a, she's a great, great example. Kudos to her as well. She was focused. She knew what she wanted. She wasn't going to, things were not going to get in her way. She still maintained a full-time job, a busy, busy full-time job all the way through that. But now she's reaping the, the benefits of that. And she, you know, she quit seven years ahead of when she planned, which is pretty phenomenal. So. And I think it just goes to show that, you know, you don't have to invest a significant amount of time in trying to build your brand as long as you're deliberate, focused, and you really have a good plan of attack, exactly what you're looking to do. So, I mean, I think if anything to the listeners is that, you know, personal branding doesn't need to take you 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week or 40 hours a week. As long as you're deliberate and understand what you're, what you're pushing for, you can achieve, you know, whatever the personal brand you want to achieve is. So that's awesome. Absolutely. That, that kind of goes off of the book that, you know, eat that frog uh, that Paul mentioned um, earlier, you know, again, just to bounce off you, Raphael and you, Paul is a little bit of time uh, here and there each day. And uh, you'll eventually get to that personal brand and where you want to be uh, and be able to invest more and more time to it. Um, and speaking of books, uh, we like to ask, what is the most impactful book, uh, Paul, that you've read that, that it could have brought you to where you are now, or it could be from childhood or any part of your life? It, uh, it, what's, what's one of the most impactful books for you? So I'm a voracious, particularly nonfiction reader. So uh, yeah. I, have my, I have my morning routine and I read 25 pages every morning. And that's, that's part of who I am and what I do. I would say that the books that had the biggest impact is Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. You know, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, you know, running your own business is a roller coaster. It, it, you know, you can ups and downs and I've had you know, some, some pretty big downs. I've had some good ups, but I've had some pretty big downs. But it, it always seemed like a struggle until I read that book. And it just, I don't know what it was, but it just totally switched my mindset. And now all my taxes are paid in advance. I have money put aside to, to enjoy. And that, that's what I love about his whole concept is that 10% does not go back in the business. And it's so tempting to go, oh, well, I'll just put it back in the business this month. But his whole thing is, you know, what's the point of running your own business and putting all that time and effort in if you're not enjoying part of it? Yeah. And, and to pay, pay that 10%, you know, I started, I started at exactly as his book recommends, you know, 1% initially, and then 3% and 5% and now 10%. You know, it just totally transformed not just my business, but my mindset. You know, the, how I approach everything now is profit first. You know, is this project going to be a profitable project? Am I charging enough for this project? Am I spending the right amount of time? Am I even using the right resources for this project? And you know, is my ten percent going to come from this? Because that's what comes out first. And then couple of times you know you, you think oh well no maybe this month i won't do it but no i've i've been doing it 10 percent every or at least now at 10 percent. so profit first it, by far his, his other books are great but that one by far is a huge game changer for me 100 percent. i love yeah. i love profit first i i utilize profit first right now i have all the accounts set up and you know every time a, com a commission check comes in, a portion goes to the operating expenses, a portion goes to you know the ten percent fund that you're mentioning, and then taxes in particular because that's one of the things that commercial real estate agents and residential agents too are notorious for is that they see that income come in, they're like, oh great, you know now I got X Y Z amount left. But in reality, it's like you know the government's going to take their 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 percentage, and if you're not on top of it, you can find yourself in the hole pretty quickly. And a lot of times, like if you're an individual owner. You know, at the end of the year, you get this huge tax bill and you're like, oh my gosh, like, how am I ever going to be able to pay this? And so with a little bit of planning and, and, and methodical action, you can. Yeah, I never looked forward to doing taxes and I never looked forward to doing my books, but the 10th and the 25th of the month and now my two favorite days of the month, because that's profit first disp disbursement days. And that I love sitting down and dispersing that money because, you know, you've already earned that money. So that's the great thing about it. So first off, I just want to thank you so much for stopping by and sharing all this information with the listeners. I mean, I, I gained a ton of value from it. So I know a lot of our guests will as well. But uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you is that as, as part of our 
you know, offering to our, our listeners is we usually ask our, our guests to contribute something to the commercial real estate treasure chest. Essentially, this is a repository of resources that we offer for free for all of our members that they can access on our website. And these, these typically include like PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, really anything that's pertaining to the commercial real estate space. And that could really va- that could be a value to our, our listeners. So I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you willing to contribute today? Yeah, so I think the best thing I can offer is uh, I have a, a PDF. It's about 30 pages. It's five key actions that you can take with your LinkedIn profile to, to attract partners and clients. So I think that would be a great use for people to, to really optimize their LinkedIn profile. And Because if you're doing the activity, the first thing people do is look at your profile. If, it, if that's not working for you, then effort is wasted. So that's, uh, that's what I'd like to give, uh, give your listeners today. Oh, for sure. No, I, I know people would gain a ton of value from that because again, like we like we mentioned, especially in the commercial real estate space, I'm with you. I think LinkedIn is a place you can do have an extreme impact in growing your brand if you're deliberate about it. And so those tips I'm sure will help a lot of our listeners. So we really appreciate it. You're welcome. We both really appreciate you coming on the, as our guest. Um, and I know people, viewers, listeners, uh, even myself is going to be one of, to try to contact you which format and how, how would you like us to get them in contact with you so you, we can? Yeah, so uh, so my email is paul at paulcopcut.com, nice and simple. My real estate uh, website is reibranded.com. And you can find me on uh, pretty much uh, LinkedIn is my main platform. So I'm welcome. I welcome any connections on, on LinkedIn. Um, but I, I do say that you know, I need to know you and like you and trust you if i'm going to introduce you to somebody or at least somebody else says you're good you're a good good, good person um sure. but i'm happy to connect i do you know a little bit on facebook but uh, the other ones i'm not really i, I may mean, i do spend some time but not a ton of time so yeah probably linkedin email or, or my website awesome and we'll include that in the show notes below so our listeners can at, gain access to it and really be able to get get access to you so if you're watching this on youtube it's going to be in the description below and if you're listening to this on apple podcast same it'll also be in the description below so Awesome. Well, Paul, really, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate your time. If you guys who are listening or watching this on YouTube, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm and ensures more and more people can hear this message. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, feel free to drop us a five-star review and really just comment on the episode. We really appreciate all the feedback, and it really helps with the algorithm to be able to share with, with a broader audience. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next week. 